Hey guys, this is Cobain the Christian. Today what we're going to do is we're going to start an open-ended series of relatively concise videos. I'm committed to making these less than 20 minutes max, hopefully less than 15 to 10 minutes. A series of videos discussing biblical answers to Protestant questions and criticisms. My goal here is to be respectful, to be clear, and to be biblical in a holistic way. That is, don't just proof text one or two bits here and there and then appeal to the mere fact of patristic tradition when one doesn't know how to answer a counter argument. Instead, show that the patristic theology, which is preserved in the tradition of the church, is the best interpretation of scripture, even on its own terms. Before getting into today's subject, I just want to remind you that if you have not made a contribution to my Patreon, I ask you to please consider doing this if you're in a financially good position. So, some people have asked me why I haven't paywalled more of my videos and have encouraged me to do so. I understand I would get more patrons that way, but I really am committed to keeping as much stuff free to the general public as possible. That said, um, if you do benefit from this content and if you uh, are able to become patrons uh, your contribution would be extraordinarily helpful in making that remain the case and in reducing ads as we go forward okay so what i want to talk about is the question of first timothy 2 5. this is a question that i haven't made a specific video about in part because i've wanted my focus to be the more complicated extended stuff but i realized last night when i was on discord someone asked the question we really do need a series of answers to these classic protestant questions and criticisms because it's not always easy to answer it took me quite a long time uh, relative to the uh, my lifespan to really develop not only a way of reading this text but a way of articulating that in a persuasive way so the fundamental and governing concept of this discussion is going to be two different concepts of unity and that's a oneness of reduction versus a oneness of expansion and i think that this difference is often not taken into account not only in this context but also in many others the oneness of reduction is the kind of oneness that you get if you have, say, a hundred tennis balls. And one by one, you remove one tennis ball at a time until you're left with three, then you're left with two, and then you're left with one single tennis ball. This sort of oneness is a oneness which denotes and signifies one particular object which could be multiplied, so it's less than that which is multiple but the kind of oneness that i think is most relevant in approaching first timothy 2 5 and indeed is most relevant in speaking about who god is is the oneness of expansion as i've called it or the oneness of unification would be another way to speak about it this is a oneness which expands to unify all distinction in itself not by eliminating that distinction, but by placing every distinct subject in its proper context. So God unifies everything in himself. Everything that exists, exists in God. And it exists because it is an imprint of a perfection that inheres eternally in the mind of God. Nevertheless, it is not as if we are meeting halfway between diversity and unity. Rather, unity in its being unity is perfected in its gathering together all things such that they are placed in their organically proper relationship. In historic theology, this concept has been called totus Christus. And so I have contextualized it in light of world redemptions, a world redemption in toto Christo. And what that means is the whole Christ, head and body, and as scripture repeatedly insists, the body of Christ is the church. So in Galatians chapter 3, Paul says with regard to the promises of the seed of Abraham, that seed was Christ, or that seed was the Messiah. 
And the context of this is Paul's exposition of the unity of Abraham's offspring such that it is not permissible to refuse to eat with the Gentiles. Jews and Gentiles are to share one table. I think it's possible they're actually talking about sharing Eucharistic communion. That is the table of tables. I won't die on that hill, but it's an interesting idea. So that seed was Christ. Paul exposits in terms of Paul, uh, uh, Genesis, not saying many seeds, but one seed. Now, there is a sense in which the Pentateuch does indeed prophesy a particular individual seed of Abraham. John Sealhammer has gone into that in some detail. But there is a close relationship between the promise of the unique and singular seed of Abraham and the promise of the unified Abrahamic family from all the nations of the world. And that is the sense in which Paul is quoting it. Paul is quoting it in order to demonstrate the significance of the reality that the one Christ is the linchpin of the unity of the one family. What Christ has, his church has. We're told in the New Testament that we share in the riches of God's glory in Jesus Christ. Well, think about a marriage. The church is the body of Christ and husband and wife are one flesh. Uh, so for the church to become the bride of Christ is to be joined to his body so that one body and bride are two sides of the same coin. If a bride comes into a marriage with a great deal of debt and she marries someone who is quite wealthy, when they combine their assets, all of the debts that she has will be made up for and paid. When we are in Christ, those debts that we have are paid up. Debt being, in this context, the gap between what we ought to be in virtue of our being created in the image of God and what we actually are. We share in God's uncreated life. It's communicated to us. So, by the Holy Spirit, in Jesus Christ, by being conformed to the likeness of his cross, we inherit the world to come. We're given a title to be redeemed on the last day. That kind of language is used in Ephesians 1, where... Uh, it is the Holy Spirit is a down payment or a kind of check which you redeem. That's the word that's used. You redeem it on the last day when you come into your inheritance. This financial terminology is not used haphazardly. It is used with a very definitive inner logic. And this expansive unity has very significant implications for the way that we conceive of the intercession or mediation of Christ. Because if we understand unity in this sense, then what Christ has, we have, not only in the sense that we receive it to the benefit of our own salvation, though that's true, but we become like Christ in that by the Spirit, we become instruments for him to communicate grace to other people. Ephesians 2, 14, 15 says, For he himself is our peace, who has made us both one, that's Jews and Gentiles, that he might create in himself one new man out of the two. So we see the singular language of Christ being one, and of this one being one man, is used not to denote Christ as an individual, but to denote totus Christus, the whole Christ, head and body, all nations being gathered into his family. And the fact that this is stated in the context of Paul's exposition of the church as the temple of the Holy Spirit is immensely significant in view of 1 Timothy 2.5 because you must keep in mind that the language of mediation is language which is associated with the high priesthood. You look at the books of Leviticus, Numbers, Isaiah, all of this high priestly stuff is about being mediating, mediator of the covenant. And in Galatians, Moses is called a mediator. Why? Because what the high priest does is he is able to pass through a series of veils in the tabernacle. And the high priest is an is a imprint or type of the archetype who is Moses himself. That's why the first high priest is Moses' own brother to signify this kind of consubstantiality. Moses passes through these veils by ascending up Sinai, and the tabernacle is a kind of moving Mount Sinai. I don't have time to get into this right now, but if you read Michael Morales in his book, uh, uh, 
ascending the mount of the Lord, you will find this demonstrated uh, in great detail. And he is, uh, of course, a Protestant scholar. Uh, so the fact that this one man language in Ephesians 2 is being specified in the context of the temple, where the high priest, of course, serves, and that 1 Timothy 2 is talking about high priestly language and Jesus as high priest, well, that starts to point the way towards a answer to the Protestant criticism. Another passage, Zechariah 49, and the Lord will be king over all the earth. On that day, the Lord will be one and his name one. Look at the way that the unity of the Lord is placed right next to the unity of all nations around his throne. In that day, the prophet says, the Lord will be one and his name one. That's an allusion to the Shema here, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. The unity of God in the book of Deuteronomy is the foundation for the unity of uh, the nation of Israel. That's why they have one God, one sanctuary, they're one people with one king in the future. God's unity is a pattern or paradigm for the unity of mankind. And in Zechariah, in context, what's going on is that all the nations are being shown the glory of God so that they will all gather to worship God in a renewed Jerusalem where life flows out in all directions. So we must keep in mind that when we speak of the oneness of Christ and the oneness of God, this is consistently stated, not in a reductive sense, that Christ is one in the sense that he extends nothing of himself within the framework of this oneness to others. He is one in the sense that no other or that no creature at all could possibly have the qualities that are being predicated of him in this context. In fact, it's exactly the opposite. Ephesians chapter 4 speaks of one God and Father, one Lord, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who's over all and through all and all. And in that context, he speaks of the unity of the church, one body. The oneness of God, the oneness of Christ, is the pattern for the oneness of the body. Thus, that which belongs to Christ in his oneness is actually communicated to the church. This is what mediation is all about. So why bring it up in 1 Timothy 2.5? Let's read the passage. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgivings. I want to point out to you that the word here is Eucharistios. Eucharists. Be made for all men, for kings, all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good and pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people. There's this expansive sense who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For, what that means is, because of everything I've just said, I'm going to say this. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man, Christ Jesus. So this is about the church. Those who are familiar with the Orthodox liturgical tradition will remember that we pray for those in authority, specifically. We pray for, for those who are in authority, president of the united states all civil authorities and then we say lord have mercy mercy coming from this old testament context where it denotes that quality by which god is faithful to do what he has promised to do god has promised to respond to our prayers thus we say lord be merciful respond as you have sworn and we do this in the context of a eucharistic liturgy a thanksgiving it's not essential to my argument, but it is very interesting to point out. Prayers be made for all men in this very context. We pray for the unification of all mankind. And I would, I would point out to some of my skeptical viewers that this basic liturgical pattern is much more ancient than you might be aware. In an interesting book called The Apostolic Liturgy and the Epistle to the Hebrews, the author argues that the epistle to the Hebrews reflects in many and detailed ways the liturgical phraseology of that liturgical tradition which belongs to the Church of Jerusalem, that is the liturgy of St. James. Now, there's no question that that liturgical tradition has developed in its transmission to the present. Nevertheless, there is very strong evidence, including in the New Testament, 
that the pattern and structure of that liturgy goes back to the apostles themselves. That's also evidenced by the fact that all of the things that I've just mentioned, so far as I'm aware, are present in every place that the liturgical tradition is preserved. That is, there are multiple liturgies from different cultures and different languages which have these same characteristics, indicating it must go back to the point before these peoples spread out into the, these various churches. So why does Paul mention Christ's unique mediation? Because he is speaking to Timothy, who is the authority of the church. He is the one who ordains the presbyters. He is the one where the buck stops. Paul is speaking to this guy, the liturgical celebrant, the pastor of the city church, uh, as it were. He commends him to continue these liturgical practices, including the public reading of scripture. That's a liturgical practice, no question about that. And it is in this very context that the unique mediation of Christ is mentioned, not because it's something in which men do not share, but because it is something in which men do share. Why is it that we should make intercessions for all mankind? Because Christ is one, and we are in Christ, and mankind is to be one in Christ. Therefore, the only consistent way to realize this is to make formal liturgical intercession for all of mankind. There is one human family who is made one in the one Christ, Ephesians chapter 2. Uh, and that is realized in our intercession. So this, far from contradicting the doctrine that the saints could have a could have standing to make intercession for us, that their prayers are significant, contrary to the idea that First Timothy two contradicts that. First Timothy two is an essential part of that case, because First Timothy two explains the reason why the prayers of the saints, by which I mean all Christians here in this context, the reason that their prayers matter is because there's one Christ and Christ's power, his gift is communicated by the one spirit to the one human family, which makes it the one church. So the communion of saints, the first resurrection, take a look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, thrones are set and seated on them as those to whom the authority to judge is committed. Now, if you look at Revelation chapter 14, these people are those who are blessed because they, blessed are those who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, for their deeds follow them and they may rest from their labors. The language of rest consistently signifies enthronement in a sanctuary context. As the psalmist says, arise, O Lord, to your rest. The king may have rest when he's defeated his enemies, and then he builds the temple, 2 Samuel chapters 6 to 7. Now, this is important. You look at the whole book of Revelation. We're looking at the throne room of God. Sometimes that's called the divine council, because in God's throne room, which is the inner sanctuary of the temple, he has counselors, many angels. You see that in the beginning of the book of Job. Or in Isaiah chapter 6, Isaiah goes into the temple. He sees the divine council. And in Isaiah 6, when he is made a prophet by the glory fire of God in the coal coming into him, that's the word of God, which now works through him, Isaiah becomes a member of that council. God calls for a member of the divine council to do a job. And the fact that Isaiah is able to do that job shows he's a member of that council. In the Old Testament, the members of, those of that council were angels. Here we see the seraphim singing, holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Well, Isaiah now becomes burning. Seraph means burning. And by tasting the burning coal, he becomes a burning one. He becomes a seraph. And his favorite title for God, or his, one of his unique titles for God, is the Holy One of Israel. He is singing like the seraphim sing. Most explicit here is Genesis chapter 20, verse 7. Now then return to the man's wife, for he is a prophet. He will pray for you, and you shall live. God is directly speaking to Abimelech. Okay, if you, if you ever want an example of being able to pray directly to God, it's right here. But when God is speaking to Abimelech, audibly, he's hearing the actual voice of God. God says, Abraham's going to pray for you. He is the prophet. He will pray for you. Abraham's being a prophet 
explains the significance of his intercession for Abimelech. My point here, in relation to Isaiah 6 in the book of Job, sorry, that's someone in the next room having technical difficulties. I apologize for that. The argument here in regard to Isaiah 6 and the intercession of Job is that a prophet is a person who, among other things, makes intercession before God. Their prayers clearly have unique standing. When James says the prayer of a righteous man is powerful when it is working or when it is energizing, literally, he is referring to the prophet Elijah, who, of course, is a prophet. The prophet has the spirit inside of him and speaks with God's breath, which has in it God's word and God's word creates worlds. Isaiah 6 demonstrates that the prophet is a member of the divine council. In the book of Job, we see this as well, although implicitly. The book opens with a scene in the heavenly council, and Job is not aware of its proceedings, but having learned wisdom by the story of the book and having been exalted, having his kingdom and wealth doubled, you compare the beginning and the end of the book, he now is a prophet. He's acquired wisdom. He has acquired the spirit who is signified in wind and Job learns all of this in the whirlwind, Job 38 to 39 and forward. It's in the whirlwind that Job learns this. Wind is a major theme of the wisdom literature because the spirit is the spirit of wisdom. Consequently, Job is able to make intercession for his three counselors at court who are condemned by God as unrighteous. So now Job is a prophet. He's a member of the divine council. He is able to make intercession. And because Revelation chapter 20 and chapter 14, speaking of the enthronement of those who repose in Christ, because that takes place in the divine council, the logic is very clear. The members of the divine council make intercession, and since the resurrection and ascension of Christ, remember the, the word resurrection, anastasis, means to stand up, it's to arise. Their ascent to the heavenly council is called the first resurrection. The second death is the bodily, unresurrection, uh, the bodily resurrection of the wicked. The first resurrection, by implication, is the bodily death of the righteous, thereby fulfilling the word of Jesus in the Gospel of John, as the Apocalypse so often does. Those who live and believe in me shall never die. I go to prepare a place for you so that where I am, you may be also. And it is therefore by that prayer that the saints are said to reign from the heavenly court. See my series of videos on prayer and the meaning of prayer to understand how prayer and reigning are uh, very closely knit together. So that is the essential argument of this video, that the oneness of Christ is that very oneness which the church has, not merely by imitation, but by participation. God, through Jesus Christ in the Holy Spirit, because God himself is a triune one, a unity, God, through Christ in the Spirit, endows the church with that very divine oneness. And as such, the church receives those things which Christ has, so that the one mediation of Christ is not a reductive unity. It is rather an expansive one, which includes those who by the Spirit are in Christ. And being in Christ, they have the capacity to implement the work of Jesus Christ by the Spirit. As the Apostle Paul says, I fill up in my flesh what is lacking in Christ's sufferings for the sake of his body that is the church. What is lacking in Christ's sufferings? Well, nothing at all except our participation in it by the Holy Spirit. That is the argument. If you want to continue to listen further, we've gone a little bit over, but that's the argument uh, in total. But... I do want to discuss these Romans texts as kind of a second route to proving the very same thing. Uh, so you can head out if you want, but if you want to hear the way that these Romans texts you see on the right are relevant, keep on listening. You'll see here that I've listed them in reverse order because the way that the scriptures frame our relationship to the world and our relationship to God is in a hierarchy which folds in and folds out. God is absolutely one. And yet the unity of God's glory is a unity which is deep. It has depth. In other words, God can extend himself in a really divine way in a multiplicity of ways, though the only way in which we 
it's possible for one operation to be known in contradistinction or in contrast to another, in separation from it, that is, is in creation, which has not been fully actualized. We'll talk another day about the unity of the energy and how that relates to um, the whole scope of Christian theology. God unfolds himself outwards in creating the world, imprinting himself into the space of contingency, so to speak, in a pyramid of successively less intense ways. So at the bottom, you have what we would call inanimate matter. And you, uh, as you ascend up the ladder, you grow closer and closer at the moment of creation to animate matter because God himself is wholly and totally animated by the uh, spirit and his divine life. Uh, so you have, you know, inanimate matter, plants, then animals with blood, and then human beings. There's a lot more complexity there, but that's kind of the long and short of it. But what goes on is that God extends himself outwards through this uh, self-extension of his procession, natural processions. Check out my videos on apophatic theology if you want to get into this. Um, and uh, in virtue of constantly flowing out from God, that's what it is. It, it is nothing other than an imprint of the constant outflow of divine life. And he is always actively sustaining it with perfect knowledge of its nature. Well, by virtue of that fact, it is always flowing back into him. And that's called procession and reversion. And in creation, that process is imprinted into things which did not have to exist. So procession and reversion, this kind of twofold pattern of divine outflow and inflow, that's something which is always flowing through the three divine persons. Well, God imprints this in various ways in the creation. And man is placed in the middle of it. You think of an hourglass, you can turn it up and you can turn it down. Now think of man as the middle of the hourglass. The hourglass could be what it was without man, but God graciously includes man as the instrument through which he's going to flow out into the world and through which he's going to flow back into the world. And so he's unfolding outwards, and then through man, the world is going to fold back into God without losing its own identity. So it's not that it's dissolved in the folding, it preserves all of its unique history, but it is folded back into him and God and the world become mutually interior, thereby fully realizing the fact that it is an imprint of the Trinitarian life in which all three divine persons are mutually interior. So we begin with the Father through Jesus Christ. And as you can see, Romans works in reverse order. It starts at the bottom and then it works up to the top until by the end of Romans 8, you are reconciled with God. Now, when Paul says God, he almost always means God the Father. One God, one Lord, one Spirit. That's 1 Corinthians chapter 12. You can see that Paul has dwelt, by the way, not only on the fact that Father, Son, and Spirit are all divine, but that it creates a set of philosophical questions about the nature of unity and diversity to begin with, because when he's talking about the unity of the body of Christ and the diversity of its gifts, it's in that context that he says, one God, many gifts, one Lord, many gifts, one Spirit, many gifts. So uh, Christian theology really was more advanced than people imagine it to have been at this point in time. But I want you to just follow the words, and these words are going to create a thread, a golden chain of redemption, you might say. Romans 8, 34, who is to condemn Christ Jesus, the one who died more than that, who was raised, who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Right hand of God, that is a quotation of Psalm 110. Psalm 110, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Uh, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So we know this is priestly. This is about intercession. This is about Christ's messianic identity. And this is about dependence on what Jesus himself taught. Sometimes Paul say, uh, people say, well, why didn't Paul reflect more knowledge of, of the teachings of Jesus? And I think he did all the time. You can see all sorts of themes from Jesus' ministry popping up in subtle ways, ways that are too subtle to have been intentional attempts to create the impression of knowledge, but uh, too close and too well distributed to be simply an illusion. That's a totally different topic. I mean, now that we're in the appendix, I'm kind of feel more free to ramble. Um, so Christ intercedes for us as part of his priestly work. 
Okay, then Romans 8, 26. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weaknesses. Remember, this is called the Spirit of Christ, the Spirit of Jesus, the Spirit of God. Uh, uh, it is the Spirit of the Father, and by saying Spirit, or He is the Spirit of the Father. I'm sorry, we should always use personal pronouns. He is the Spirit of the Father, uh, and in saying He is the Spirit of the Father, that implies the presence of the Son. So you don't have a Father without a Son. See my video on the Filioque if you want a discussion of how this all cashes out. Spirit is the Spirit of Christ in virtue of His being the Spirit of the Father. We do not know what to pray for as we ought, but the Spirit Himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words. Okay, so our prayer is perfected and empowered by the Holy Spirit who is dwelling in us with groanings too deep for words. So a couple things here which are going to link to other bits of Romans 8. So the intercession of the Spirit is stated right in the context of the intercession of Christ. And Read Romans 8, 21 to 23. The creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay and obtain the freedom, the glory of the children of God. We know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Not the creation only, but we ourselves who have the first fruit, uh, first fruit of the Spirit, groan inwardly as we wait for, for adoption of sons, the redemption of our body. Indeed, our body is the singular here. So the body, well, that's the body of Christ. Why is it singular? Because Christ is one. How does it become the body of Christ? Because by the Spirit it has died to sin so that it might live to God uh, in faith, in baptismal justification, which is the instrument of faith. And what's the upshot of this? Well, the upshot of this is that we, in that very process by which we exude confidence in our bodily resurrection, that's what the word hope means in a New Testament context. The word hope is used in Romans 8. Um, in that very process, we participate in the groanings of creation because the creation has been groaning. The only solution to that is the redemption, which is secured in Jesus Christ, the risen Lord. Well, we groan. And how do we groan? By the Spirit who joins us to Christ. And what does he join us with? The intercession of Christ. That's what Galatians chapter 4 says, the Spirit of the Son is sent into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Well, Abba, Father, even though it's iconic, is actually not that common in the New Testament. It's only used a few times. And if you want to know where it's from, read the Gospel of Mark. It's in the Gospel of Mark, Mark chapter 14, I believe. And it is when Jesus is praying for the cup to pass from him. This is Jesus in the most intimate psychological state of suffering without sin, in total confidence in God, but with the deep inner sense of what it's like to feel abandoned, despite his total confidence that he has not, in fact, been abandoned. All of the kind of emotional qualities that we experience alongside and often coming from this idea in our minds that God has abandoned us, well, Christ experienced those subjective qualities without any doubt that God had remained with him. And so the fatherhood of God in relation to Christ becomes the fatherhood of God in relation to the church. And the church participates by the spirit who gives us that sonship in the sufferings of Christ. And what's the implication? Well, the church is then the instrument for the resurrection of the world. So what is, what, what, what are, what's the creation looking for? We know that the creation had grown together in the pains of childbirth until now. Well, how is that going to be fixed? It's going to be set free. How? Because it will obtain the freedom of the glory of whom? The Son of God? Well, yes, but that's not exactly what Paul says. The children of God. The creation is redeemed because of the body of Christ. In other words, Christ's redemption is not applied to the creation except through the Spirit as he animates his body. That's why Paul says that his sufferings are for the sake of Christ's body, that is the church. So the whole idea that the absolute sufficiency of Christ excludes the participation of Christ's body in the communication of grace, which gives salvation, that is totally undermined, not only by one or two passages, but by the whole pattern of New Testament revelation. Now, the fact that it is undermined in that way doesn't prove that the intercession of saints is a real thing or the prayer through the saints, two or through the saints, is a real thing. It doesn't prove that, but what it does show is that this is definitely not a good argument to use against it. And also, asking 
can the saints hear us or not? You can ask that. It's not a bad question, but it's not the question that is being asked in invoking 1 Timothy 2. So we always want to keep in mind what argument is being raised and not just jump from argument to argument. And both sides are equally guilty of this, by the way. So this, I'm not ragging on Protestants here. We need to stick to one topic at a time and work and only move to other topics insofar as they relate in a real and organic way to the main topic at hand. Now, I've pointed here to the use of the word first fruit, and I've uh, uh, compared it to Romans 11, 16, 1 Corinthians 15, 20, and 23. The word first fruit is used eight times in the New Testament. It's not that common a word. And I pointed to these other texts because it shows the pattern of relationships which facilitates the redemption of the world. Well, Romans 11, 16, uh, what Romans 11, 16 says is that by the Spirit, the uh, there has been a remnant of Israel which has become a first fruits to God. So we see this language of first fruits for the kind of initial believers in the letter of James. We see at the end of Romans. We all see it at the end of uh, uh, 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 16. Uh, and the reaping of these first Jewish believers as first fruits by the Spirit, well, that is actually the means by which the lump as a whole is sanctified. That's really important. The whole lump, Paul says in Romans 11, we can have confidence that it is consecrated to God, that it is holy. So we offer our bodies as a, or our body, singular, as a pleasing offering to God. Well, the reason that we're confident that the whole lump is going to be sanctified is because there's the first fruits. And that first fruits in this context is not actually Jesus himself. It is the initial participants in the body of Christ. That's the remnant of Israel according to the election of grace. 1 Corinthians 15, 20 to 23. Here, first fruits refers to the, for the resurrection of Jesus, the Messiah. So we see the way in which these two things relate to each other. Jesus rises from the dead and he brings a, a first fruits church with him. I think that's part of what's going on in Matthew 27 when we're told that uh, some of the, uh, the saints uh, who had died before Christ are resurrected and they appear to people after Jesus' uh, resurrection. Um, on a historical level, we'll talk about that another day. I actually don't think it's, it's, it's nearly as problematic as people think. Um, but there's also Jewish tradition, and it's quite widespread, that when the Messiah comes, he's going to bodily raise a small number of people to assist him in building up the kingdom over time. Well, in Christian tradition, this is the Virgin Mary. The Virgin Mary is one of those few people bodily resurrected and assumed into heaven that, uh, who then participate in a special way with the Messiah in building up the kingdom of God. And there are some traditions out there that there may have been a couple of other people assumed to heaven. Uh, won't get into that now. But we can see here this idea is not something that was just invented later on. It's living within this Jewish world and it has an inner coherence to it. Um, so Christ is the first fruits. He extends, uh, and by his being the first fruits, uh, he gives the spirit to the first Christians. And as Christ is the instrument of redemption for them, these first Christians are the proximate instrument for the redemption of the second generation of Christians, and it multiplies outward from there. That's why Paul says, Romans, uh, or um, uh, Colossians chapter 1, the gospel has been fruitful and multiplied. The multiplication of the gospel is an analogy to the multiplication of the human family, Genesis chapter 1. In fact, teaching is a kind of fatherhood. Teaching occurs through language, through words. Out of your mouth comes breath in the Hebrew and Greek languages. That's spirit. And when you impart your spirit to a person, you give them part of your life, part of what makes you you, they assimilate to themselves. So they not only um, are, are perfections according to their own mode of individuation, but they actually share a little bit of you. So that's how Jesus can be a father to his people because he learned it from the father. Um, so also, Elisha becomes a son to the prophet Elijah, who and Elisha receives Elijah's spirit, little less. And so we see that fatherhood and the impartation of one's spirit are coextensive. That's part of what's going on here. That could be a whole video on its own. Um, now finally, Romans 8, 18, 19. I consider the sufferings of the present time not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed in us. I think it is definitely in and not to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revelation of the sons of God. So that's the big point here. 
What is the creation waiting for? It's waiting for the revelation of the sons of God. What does that look like? It looks like the resurrection in a glorious body. How are they raised in a glorious body? Because they share in the glory of Christ. How do they share in that now? They share in it through baptism in which they trust the promises of God made in baptism. Romans 6, 4, they, Jesus is raised by the glory of the Father. We're raised with Jesus in baptism. And how do they get that glory? By the Spirit. The Spirit communicates that glory. That is why Romans 1, 3 to 4 says, He was descended from David according to the flesh. He was declared to be the Son of God in power according to the Spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead, Jesus Christ our Lord. So there is a whole structure of reality which explains why the unique mediation of Jesus is so important and why actually its implication is the precise opposite of the uh, premise of the, uh, the evangelical or Protestant criticism. The unity of Christ is a unity which gathers us in and incorporates us into it. Some people respond by uh, trying to make out that this is a kind of allegorical or secondary use of the word one. But I say that actually misses the point at a very deep level. And that's because what is oneness? Well, oneness is an echo of that which pre-exists in God, like anything is. Everything that, that exists, any quality which is actually intelligible, is an echo of something in God's mind. Well, the Trinity is not a compromise between oneness and threeness. It is only in God's being perfectly three that he subsists as one. And it is only by his being perfectly one that he subsists as three. You can't have an idea of multiplicity unless you have a concept of unity. And you can't have a concept of unity unless you have a concept of multiplicity. Because of what's being, what's being unified or what's being reduced away, if you want to go with that reductive concept. They're going to need to contextualize each other no matter what. So that's the argument. Uh, I know it looks like I went twice over, but uh, the essence of the argument is communicated in the first uh, 20 or 3 or so minutes. So, you know... I really did try my best more than more than usual to, uh, uh, to communicate as concisely as I could. It may just be that to deliver the kind of arguments of the caliber that I think um, really needs to be delivered in a biblical context. Uh, it may be that that 20 minutes is not doable, so maybe I'll, I'll make it 40 max. We'll see. You know, it's a work in progress. Thank you so much for listening. Uh, please do consider becoming a uh, a patron. Uh, I, I appreciate it deeply, but it really is um, instrumentally important to continuing what I'm doing right now. Um, I'll, I'll have more to say on this, um, and I imagine most people have clicked off at this point, but I'm thinking of doing live streams um, announced in advance, uh, in part because people can pay to get their questions knocked to the top and answered, and that uh, uh, that may well be a boon for my finances. But one thing I do want to say is... I know that I don't provide as much premium content as other creators do. The reason that I don't is because I don't like to paywall stuff. There are some people who provide for families and just need to paywall stuff. I do need the money, to be honest, but I don't need as much as, as they do. So I'm a bit more confident that I'm going to be able to pull this off without paywalling that much. So if you do become a patron, um, Please keep in mind that that uh, it's so helpful and um, it'll help me reduce ads and, you know, we'll see where things go. Uh, but I'm very appreciative and I, I do apologize if people feel there hasn't been enough content. Um, but again, I do want to keep things um, as available as possible. I want to pique as many people's interests as possible. Uh, so thanks so much for listening and I'll see you next time. Uh, pray for me, please. Seriously.